Uh, Matthew chapter 11. Uh, as we get into the next few weeks, these chapters are packed. I don't know if you noticed, but there's just a lot there. And so, uh, given the half an hour or so that I have to do my teaching, there's absolutely no way that I can speak to everything. Uh, I, could, I could literally spend a half an hour on each of these pericopes, these little sections. And so, uh, if there's something that uh, I don't answer, that you still have a question, and the further reading that we post doesn't help you out at all, uh, shoot me an email, because that's, that's my sweet spot, is when somebody's asking me a question and then I can pontificate as much as I want. <laughs> it's really fun for me, so um, feel free to do that. And tonight's one of those. I had to cut a lot of good stuff just to kind of package it in a time frame that uh, fits for the night, so. Matthew chapter 11, so here we go. Uh, we start with that statement when Jesus had finished giving instructions, which ties back into the previous chapter, right? So that's one of our, our literary devices that Matthew is using to conclude the previous discourse in the previous chapter, chapter 10. And so that's how we start this one. And he, he comes up with this uh, version of John the Baptist, what happens with John the Baptist here in verse 2. So uh, John has some questions. He's imprisoned, and we did a little bit of work. We went, I believe, to the book of Mark, right, to find out why. Did we find out why John the Baptist is imprisoned? Because he publicly spoke out against um, dueling Herods and the marital dispute that was going on between the leaders of the country. When Herod the Great passed away, the country was split into three parts. And so uh, two of his sons, Philip and Antipas uh, took over, and Philip had a wife, and Antipas stole the wife, seduced the wife, and, and that's what John the Baptist was speaking out against, okay? And that wasn't a good popular message, so he was put in a prison on the other side of the Dead Sea, south, way out in the middle of nowhere, okay? And as you might imagine, uh, they didn't uh, allow him to have access to Facebook or the internet or anything out there. And so he's getting word about Jesus' ministry periodically from visitors that come to see him. And he's beginning to question what's going on, right? So he asks the questions and he sends this question, are you the expected one or shall we be looking for someone else? Which seems like if you know the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, it seems like a weird question, doesn't it? I mean, where's John the Baptist coming from? He's just not a guy that happened upon Jesus one day and saw him or heard him teach or saw a miracle. What's his background? He's actually related. I mean, he's, he's the one that preceded Jesus in birth just by a short time. And his whole life, you can imagine, He's been hearing the stories from his aunt, Mary, and from his mom and his dad about how this whole thing came to pass and what his ministry is going to be and how he left in the womb, right, when he heard about the Christ being conceived. So it's an odd situation that here, this late, we find John the Baptist asking this question, uh, which is actually, if you think about it, it's kind of comforting in a way that we have permission. Uh, we see this in the book of Job too, right? We have permission to have doubts within the faith that is saving us at the same time. And I think a lot of times our society, which is it, kind of this one pole or the other pole, right? You either have to have faith or you don't have faith. And what we see here, and we see throughout scripture, is it okay to have, it's okay to have faith and be questioning that faith along the way. Does that make sense? It's a good, healthy faith to be doing that. And that's what we see with John the Baptist. Where is John the Baptist in this? Well, he's found himself in a situation that is making him question, is he really the one or should we be expected? Did I misunderstand what was going on here? Because his version of Messiah isn't coming to play out. We see that with the disciples. We probably see this with just about everybody that has a concept of what Messiah is. Jesus' ministry is not turning out at all like people expected it. And so 
probably throughout the land, people are asking this question. It's the same one that John the Baptist is asking. Uh, we see a similar question in Luke chapter 24, verse 21. Uh, this is the uh, disciples that are on the road to Emmaus. I've skipped way ahead here, so we're now in uh, Luke 24. We're after the death burial, and we're in the resurrection period of, of Christ before his ascension. And there's these two disciples that Christ comes upon on a road to Emmaus, and he has a discourse with them. And they have similar language because they don't understand. They say, uh, we were hoping that it was this guy, Jesus, that we've been telling you about, and they're talking to him, which is kind of ironic, um, who's going to redeem Israel. We had in our head how this thing was going to play out, and it's not playing out that way. And this is the question that John the Baptist has. And given that question, Jesus sends back a response, right? And we went, I sent you in the lesson, we sent you to the uh, two different places in Isaiah that Jesus either quotes from or alludes to in his response. Did you ever notice that he could have just answered this straight out? Are you the one? What would have been the easy way? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just hold on. You don't understand, but just yes. But that's not what Jesus does, which is interesting. So we're going to take, I'm going to take a quick look at the two verses. I know that uh, we're not going to spend a ton of time because we've already been there in our lesson. Um, but I want to point out a couple things. That when he refers, he first refers um, to Isaiah 35. And let's get back to our Matthew here. I want to read it here. Go report to John the Baptist uh, what you hear and see. The blind, but oh, by the way, hear and see. If you remember, Matthew 5 through 7 is the hearing, right? And then it's followed by the miracle, two chapters of miracles, and that's the scene, right? So this is dual ministry of Jesus. He, he tells the truth and then he backs it up with authority, uh, with visual signs. Go and tell him what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. You'll notice in my version of the Bible, the NASB, that that is in uppercase letters, capital, capital letters. That's because uh, that is either a, a tight allusion to a direct quote of an Old Testament verse, okay? And that's out of Isaiah 35. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So we've got two Isaiah passages that Jesus is going to, and I just want to point out a couple things really quick. Isaiah 35, take a look. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Does that make sense? That's one of the things Jesus mentioned. It's not verbatim, but it's one of the topics. Blind people coming. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Yes? Make the list. The lame will leap like a deer. Yep. Tongue of the mute will shout for joy. Does Jesus mention mutes? Not specifically in that. So this is where it's not a direct quote, it's more of an illusion. But it's, there's also some other differences. And as we scroll back, so we got the blind, the lame. He adds lepers. Lepers aren't in Isaiah 35, right? But then we go to the deaf, that's there. And then he mentions the dead. The dead were the dead being raised in Isaiah 35? It's not in that list, okay? There's other things that he mentions, but not that. So Jesus here, does Jesus know what's in Isaiah 35, by the way? Yeah. yeah. Do you think John knows what's in Isaiah 35? <coughs> Another valid question. Um, do we know what's in Isaiah <laughs> Typically, we don't. That's why I'm walking you through this. But it is safe to assume that whenever Jesus quotes an Old Testament passage, especially when he's not quoting it verbatim, but he's alluding to it, where he's picking and choosing, it's safe to assume he knows exactly what he's quoting and what he's not and when he's adding something and when he's deleting something, right? That makes sense. It's also safe to assume that his audience, maybe not his entire audience, but in this case, John the Baptist, it's safe to assume that John the Baptist understands that as well. All those details of adding, subtracting, mentioning, not mentioning, John the Baptist is as familiar with Isaiah as the best scholars of the day, okay? John's in prison, 
he's sending this cryptic message that alludes to Isaiah 35, but we're adding some lepers being cleansed and we're adding the dead being raised. And then we switch to Isaiah 61. You see that the poor have the gospel preached to them. And if we hop over to Isaiah, this is uh, also uh, what Jesus reads when he gets up in the synagogue in Luke chapter 4 in Nazareth. And he's handed the scroll of Isaiah and he reads from that scroll. Do you remember that? If you are familiar with that? This is the exact same passage. And he again goes back to it in this setting. And he says to, what portion of his, is he quoting here? The gospel is preached, the good news. Okay? Uh, good news. Yes, to bring good news, that's gospel. Good news is literally gospel to the afflicted, okay? Now, Jesus plucks this line out of Isaiah 61. I just want to point out to you what else is in Isaiah that Jesus doesn't quote. It's directly following this. To bring good news to the afflicted, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, why is that important? John is a captive. But Jesus doesn't quote this. Does John know that this is here? And when Jesus doesn't quote it, does John take notice of that? What's next? And freedom to the prisoners. Now, this can be understood, obviously should be understood in a spiritual sense. He's giving us... A, the captives to sin freedom. That's ultimately the fulfillment of this. But this is a, a quote talking about uh, the sabbatical year, the year of Jubilee, where literally captives in the physical world would be set free. Okay? That's what this is, the, the context of this passage. But Jesus just plucks this one, the good news, the gospel is being spread. Okay? So, let's marry these two together. Isaiah 35 and 61. What does Jesus do? He mentions the spattering of Isaiah 35. He adds what? Raising the dead, which is not in either of these passages. And then when he gets to 61, what does he not say? To John the Baptist, specifically, in his circumstance. You're not going to get out of the situation you're in and what's the ultimate ending if you're not getting out of prison what happens to you in prison you die and we know that John the Baptist was beheaded uh, much quicker than just dying a, a long death in prison or a life sentence there Jesus I think cryptically is saying to John through his picking and choosing of what he quotes and what he does not quote I think he's sending a message to John that John would have understood that John your circumstance you're not getting out of this physical prison that you're being held in you're gonna die there but what did he add what is the good news he has power over the problem that John is walking into there is freedom in the resurrection and we've been doing it we've been raising people from the dead so John don't despair in your circumstances even though you're not getting out of this you will ultimately see the glory and get out of this so make sense kind of cryptic piecemeal together but that's a message that John needed to hear right because John wasn't getting out of this it wasn't playing out at all like he had expected. His idea of Messiah would have been what? Well, if he knew his passages in Isaiah, right before what we quoted, your God will come with a vengeance and recompense, and God will come, but he will save you. And then it goes into how he will save you. But this is the God of vengeance that Jesus isn't fulfilling in his first ministry, his first coming, but it is coming in his second coming. Does that make sense? How do I know this? Well, let's take a look at Isaiah 61. Did you notice? I highlighted it in red. 
directly following this uh, is to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, that's the year of Jubilee, the fulfillment of that actually, and the day of vengeance. But God, Jesus doesn't mention that here. In fact, that is where he stops in Luke chapter 4 when he reads the Isaiah scroll in the synagogue in Nazareth. He stops mid-sentence and he says, I'm here to do this. This is coming, but it's not this time. And he's doing a thing with John the Baptist. He's clarifying what the role of Messiah is. And it's interesting because with all the healings and even what we see in the book of Acts with uh, cell doors of prisons opening up and people going free, could Jesus have freed John the Baptist? Is there any question? But he doesn't, which is interesting. It's a hard message to hear because we want our healing to happen here, now, in this life. I want, I want what's wrong with me fixed now. And at the basis of the gospel message, at the basis of the gospel message, the message of the gospel is you will be healed, but it may not be here. But the dead are being raised. And thank God that that's the message, right? That's a good message. And it's okay to go in with the doubt and start asking questions. Right? That's how your faith ultimately grows. Uh, when you don't address your doubt and you just push it back into the corner, that's when your doubt can sometimes overtake you because you never get to a place where you have an answer for the faith that lies within. Okay? So I just encourage you. Uh, let's keep moving through. Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. Just want to, I'm not going to go into great detail here, but Jesus does something uh, strange with this passage out of Malachi 3.1. Uh, we didn't spend a ton of time. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Jesus is referring to Malachi 3.1 where God is talking to Malachi. God, uh, uh, God the Father, the Old Testament, is talking to Malachi, a prophet of the Old Testament. And he says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before who? Before you? He says, Before me. This is a ultimately fulfilled with John the Baptist. Okay? And in the Old Testament, God says, I'm going to send, ultimately, John the Baptist before me to clear the way. And it's God the Father talking. This is what Jesus is quoting back in Matthew 11, 10, but he says, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. It's still God the Father talking, and it's still about John the Baptist, the messenger, but it says, I send my messenger before you, Jesus. But in the Old Testament passage, who did the you refer to? Who, who was John the Baptist coming before? God. And now it's referring to Jesus switched one word and he makes it about him, which makes Jesus claiming, what is Jesus claiming about himself? That he is God. Do you see that? It's those types of little details that would have been apparent to the original hearers, would have been apparent to the people that knew their Old Testament very well, that Jesus, this is the type of statement that people get up and say, if they didn't think Jesus was who he said he was, this is the type of thing that gets them all riled up. Because that's what he's doing. He's claiming to be very God himself. Okay? Um, John the Baptist is least in the kingdom. Uh, uh, he, he's the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, but anybody in the New Testament version of the kingdom is greater than him. Why is that? How can that be? Well, there's... Uh, if you go to the commentaries, there's a couple different answers that you might read. One is definitely the giving of the Holy Spirit, as done originally on the day of Pentecost and following. Um, so the Old Testament, we have, a, we have a, a slightly different relationship with the Holy Spirit in an indwelling personal relationship sense, different slightly than 
the Spirit's function in the Old Testament. So because of that difference, all the Old Testament prophets didn't get what everybody in the New Covenant gets. And so even the least in the New Covenant is greater because of that than the New. Does that make sense? So that, it, it's not trying to say John the Baptist wasn't as good as from a functional standpoint. It was just the era in which he lived. Now we're reading about John the Baptist in the New Testament, so that's kind of confusing, or could be. But until this death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, and then the day of Pentecost in Acts when the Holy Spirit is sent, we're still kind of in Old Testament times, theologically speaking, even though we're reading about it here in the New Testament. Um, this generation, let's pop down to verse 16 through 19. But what shall I compare this uh, to this generation? Uh, to what shall I compare this generation? I sent you on a little rabbit chase. There have been a bunch of rabbit holes about this generation in the book of Matthew. Did you? Did anybody look up all of those? Yes. Oh, a couple. Good. The rest of you? No. We've got plenty of time because they're all in Matthew. And <laughs> get them get them. Okay, so no big deal. But um, how did you, how did that discussion go about what is, who is this generation? Is it this generation that we're in? Well, clearly in some of these, the context has to be the generation that Jesus is ministering to right then and there, okay? Uh, some of them, there's a debate going on in theological circles about uh, some of those passages that I sent you to about they might apply to different groups of people or different generations that may come in the future. But clearly, the majority of them, and we'll tackle them as we get to them, but the majority of those, I just wanted to point out that it's that generation, it's that evil generation, it's that generation where the temple of God is being administered and led by people that don't even believe in that God. Right? We've talked about this. This is a theme in Matthew. It's a struggle between two temples, right? It's the temple of Jesus bringing in the new covenant, and it's the temple, uh, the physical temple, the rebuilt second temple that Herod had built, and um, it was being mismanaged, and it wasn't functioning the way it was intended to function. And Jesus is bringing in a new administration. So a lot of the time, I, I would say most of the time, if not all the time, that you read this generation, we should be understanding it in that sense. That specific generation. Okay, And so uh, as we get, we'll see it again next week in chapter 12, a couple times, maybe three times, and then 16, 17, 23, and 24. It's coming. Okay, So I'll, I'll take those in context as we get to them. Um, but let's look. It's kind of an interesting little, uh, we're at 732. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> it's like children, verse 16, sitting in the marketplaces, who call out to the other children. This generation is like this analogy. It's like children in the marketplace calling out to other children. Now, I don't know if you've ever played a game with a child. How many people have done that? How many people try not to do that on a daily basis? <laughs> That's me. Why? Why don't we like playing games with children? Well, they want to keep playing, and we're tired, and we want to go to bed. That's one thing, but that's a personal issue. Um, children, when it comes to the rules, what do they think? Either there are no rules, or they make the rules. Yes. Candyland, there's no prime or reason. Okay? You can take five cards in a row. You can skip chutes and ladders all over the place. You can go up chutes and down ladders and all. You know, it's a crazy mess, right? That's what it's like playing a game with a child. Yes. And that's what Jesus is using as an analogy here. But he's using it in theological or spiritual terms about the coming of the Messiah. So let's read it in that. Uh, it's like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to other children, verse 17, and say, we played, this is the children, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. Well, when, when is a flute played? At a wedding, yes. It's at a wedding. And then on the flip side of that, we sang a dirge and you did not mourn. When are those played? Funeral. At funerals. So we're in the wedding and funeral. If you know anything about literature, 
weddings are comedic in nature, in, in those two, uh, two masks, the smiley, happy face, that's the comedic mask, okay? Comedies always end in weddings or carnivals. The frowny face is the tragic mask, and it always ends in death, okay? The death of a salesman, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's a tragedy by definition. Don't want to give this away, but somebody dies. <laughs> it's the salesman. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Okay, we played the flute for you. Here are the children talking in the marketplace back. We played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. And then John came, neither eating nor drinking, now, of these two characters, comedic or tragic, who's John? If he came not eating or drinking? That's the tragic. That's what you do when you're in mourning, right? So he came as a tragic figure in the kingdom, in this messianic message time of uh, age. And they said he had a demon. They didn't like how he was playing the game. You see that? And the Son of Man came, eating and drinking. Who is he in the two? He's the comedic, he's at the wedding, he's drinking, like uh, in the miracle of Cana, where he supplies the wine, that's what happens at weddings, is, okay? So he came eating and drinking, and they called him a glutton, somebody that eats too much, and a drunkard, somebody that drinks too much. We didn't like the way he played the game either. So this generation, spiritually speaking, when it comes to the introduction of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven coming to earth, they want to set the rules. They want to call the shots on how this thing plays out. And when it doesn't go their way, what do they do? They take their ball and they go home. Does that make sense? Yes. That's what this generation is like. They don't like the way this is playing out. They're like little children. Okay? I hope that's helpful. That was actually helpful for me as I worked through that because you read through that and it's one of those you read through quickly and then you don't get back to it. Uh, not because you don't have a question, but because you just you don't have an answer. So <laughs> let's just not go back. So what's the last sentence? Mean? Yeah, so wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Well, I'm glad you asked, because I actually have an answer for you. Now, of all the questions you have that I don't have answers, skip those, please. Okay. <laughs> Wisdom ha is vindicated by her deeds. This word deeds here is the exact same word in the Greek, although it doesn't show the same in the English. It's the exact same word as if we went all the way up to the front, and it says, now when John was imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ, that's the exact same Greek word as deeds down talking about wisdom is being vindicated by deeds. Okay? So we're playing this game of the kingdom of God. It's being presented. The kids don't like it, but we're not changing the rules, right? And what vindicates the person trying to play this game out the right way? Well, it's wisdom. And how do we know that they're wise? because of what they do. And Jesus is doing the wise deeds. He is performing the deeds of the kingdom of heaven. And so who is wisdom here? Wisdom is personified often in the Old Testament. But who is wisdom being played by here? It's very Christ himself. He is the definition of wisdom. And he is the one, as we scroll down, yet Jesus, we could put in, is vindicated by his deeds. Now it's her because wisdom is a feminine idea, but we understand the correspondence there. It's the deeds of Christ that will show that he is the one that knows how this game is played. Children don't know, they don't understand. They're gonna whine and complain, but it's the deeds of the wise that will show how the game's and who's in charge.
Matthew uh, 11, 20. We have three cities mentioned, Chorazin, Bethsaida, and Capernaum. I think I can click on this. This is the Sea of Galilee down here. We've got Capernaum on the sea, Bethsaida about six miles away, give or take, and Chorazin about three or four miles away. I've heard different versions, but we're all within a six mile radius. This is a triangle and Jesus spent time in these cities. We don't hear hardly anything about Chorazin, except in the woe passages. Uh, Bethsaida, there's three of the disciples that come from Bethsaida. There's a healing that happens there. But other than that, there's not much. Capernaum, on the other hand, what is Capernaum? It's the home base for Jesus. And as you go through the Gospels, if you were just to do a Capernaum concordant, uh, concordant search, what you would find is multiple healings, multiple times that Jesus taught, multiple times that Jesus is in and around. And if you were only to read those accounts of the healings and the teaching, you would get a general sense, you could get a general sense, that Jesus was very widely accepted. Okay, There were some times where people disagreed, but it was usually just the religious leaders. But the people, you might come out of a reading of the Gospels thinking, Wow, everybody in Capernaum kind of liked Jesus. I think this is here because as a whole, people, some people did understand Jesus' message and follow him and believe in him. But as a whole, they didn't. Even in the Galilee, where he did the majority of his ministry, a great light shines uh, using an Old Testament passage in this region. And it's three, these three cities that are compared to uh, some cities in the Old Testament um, that are not favorable cities. If I had more time, I'd go into the Old Testament background of those cities and uh, some of the things that are said here. Uh, obviously, Sodom of the Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, Tyre and Sidon is going to come up in a couple chapters. Uh, the Syrophoenician woman is from that area, and we'll revisit it uh, at that point. Uh, I think that's in 13, maybe 12. I don't remember. <laughs> Anybody can look that up. Um, let's kind of round this out. I want to get to the end because there's a setup for next week. Next week we, we discuss some Sabbath questions. And if you're not familiar yet, you will be by the time we're done with Matthew. Um, I did my doctoral work on the Sabbath. And so I have lots of ideas about the Sabbath and I'll be introducing those as we go along. Um, but I want to as we get to the end of this chapter, uh, verse 28 specifically, uh, come to me, as Jesus speaking, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Notice, all caps here, so we're referring back to an Old Testament passage. Anytime you see that, I would love for you to get in the habit of chasing those down on your own. Uh, anytime you see an Old Testament quote, um, go figure out what the context of that is. Because Jesus understood it, right? We can assume that he understood what he was quoting and what he's not quoting if there's something else there. And we saw that earlier. Uh, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, rest from a cosmic standpoint. I'm not talking about just biblically, but I'm talking about extra biblically. Rest is talked about in ancient cultures, even in pagan cultures. Rest is discussed. And the definition of rest is when a god sets up his temple, enters into that temple, and rules from the temple. A functional creation that has been set up by that god. Okay. This is not just a biblical idea uh, that we discuss as well. If you go back to the Old Testament, the creation narrative and uh, different things. But if you go into extra biblical literature, what you find is gods putting the world in some sort of functional order so it works correctly according to that god, whether it be a pagan god or uh, the god of the Bible, right? And then creating a temple, which is his house there on earth. He enters the temple and then he rules from that temple. A functional creation. And that's what the Garden of Eden was. It was a functional temple. Okay? 
and God created the world, he had put the world in order, and when everything's working properly, when there's no sin in the world, things are at rest. It doesn't mean you're lying in a hammock, though, taking a nap. What it means is you're working the way you were intended to work, and that's actually energizing. I don't know, um, New Testament talks specifically about Christians and how God gives us gifts, things that we are able to do for the ministry of Jesus in the church, in the body of Christ. And my experience, when I am working within my gifting, the way I was intended to work, I get done with those. Even though I might be exhausted physically, my spirit is rejuvenated through those processes. Does that make sense? I think, I know other people have this same experience because it's a godly concept. And when we are working, not as sin calls us to work, but as the way we were originally intended to function in our bodies, when we function that way, we are experiencing rest. And ultimately, that's what Sabbath is, when we're functioning correctly. And that's where this whole story is going. It was created at the beginning, sin entered, created, brought chaos back into the picture, into the rest picture, and God saved us from that chaos and is restoring a new order. I don't know if you've read the end of Revelation, there's a new heaven and new earth, and the gates that are there on the city walls, they're never closed. Why? It's because there's no enemies, because there's rest because everything's functioning the way it was intended to. And that's what our eternity is. That's what John the Baptist is experiencing now. Didn't have rest here, but he experienced that healing, that rest on the other side. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. My yoke is easy. I just want to end with this, this last, my yoke is easy. This is a reference back to 1 Kings chapter 12. And if you go back to 1 Kings chapter 12, You've got the story of Rehoboam, who's the son of Solomon, who's the son of David. So you've got the David the king, Solomon builds the temple, you've got a united kingdom. Solomon was a workhorse, he made his people work, he had a heavy yoke, that's how it's described. And then when Solomon dies, Rehoboam comes up and he has the option of going one of two directions. He can either have a heavier yoke than his father or a lighter yoke for his kingdom. And he goes and gets uh, advice from the older people and they say, you should really back off. And he goes to his friends, the young guys are aggressive, and they say, you should put the pedal to the metal and really, and he listens to his friends, yeah, just like everybody. And that divides the kingdom and it causes this state of unrest. It's a kingdom that uh, was divided then until Jesus. Jesus is the one that brings those, uh, the kingdom back together. It's under a new covenant. Okay? And so when Jesus is saying uh, in this last verse, for my yoke is easy, it's in contrast. Jesus is not just a new Moses. He's not just a new Jacob that surrounds himself with 12 and brings out a, a new Israel out of that 12, but he is a new Rehoboam who makes the wise choice that Rehoboam couldn't. He chooses the easy yoke. Coming out of an Old Testament period where the yoke was a little heavier, or it seemed to be heavy, and Jesus is saying, I am here to bring functional, to bring function back to the chaos of your life. That's a great message. The Sabbath is still relevant because the message of the Sabbath is Jesus is saying, come back to me. I know how you were created. I know your sweet spot. I know what will energize you better than anything you can try. That's the rest that he offers.
come to him. It's a good invite, isn't it? I don't know how you're tired today. I know I'm exhausted half the time. But that's a physical exhaustion. I'm tired spiritually sometimes too. And it's when I try to figure it out of myself. And I don't rely on Christ, but I try and rely on my own understanding. And, I, and the own, my own understanding, working through the circumstances of my life. Just invite you to consider Christ. And the yoke that he offers. Knowing that he is the creator of you. And he knows how you best function better than even you do. And he invites you to. Not just for eternity, but right now. We get a glimpse of it if we follow him in faith. Let's pray. Dear God, thanks for tonight. Thanks for chapter 11 of Matthew. I love how this ends, Jesus. I love how you invite us to enter into uh, functionality. And God, we see chaos all, chaos all around us. We may even be experiencing chaos right now in our lives in some way. I just invite you to stop the wheel from spinning so fast. Show us the way that we are intended to work. God, we, we so want to be energized. We so want to find that rest that you offer. So even today, even this week, as we head back into the world and face those situations in our life that may be causing us uh, unrest, uh, give us the faith to step out and follow you in a way maybe we haven't tried yet. In Jesus' name, amen.